you have to learn to give up some battles, to lose some battles in order to win the war. Oh. Welcome to NBA Pod TV. I'm your host, Mia Saini. Now, without a doubt, business schools will be paying particular attention to your quant score on the GMAT. They want to make sure that you can handle quantitative intensive classes like finance and accounting. So on today's show, we tell you how to master the quantitative section on the GMAT. Joining me are two GMAT masters from the GMAT prep company, Manhattan GMAT. We have Steve Shaheen, an LA-based GMAT instructor who breezed by with a score of 750. And we also have Chris Ryan, Director of Product and Instructor Development, who scored, get this, only a 790. The quantitative section comes after the essays and before the verbal section. It's 75 minutes in length and it's 37 questions, so you have roughly two minutes per question. There are two types of quantitative questions. Problem solving, where you are asked a question such as what is X and then the answer choices A, B, C, D, and E correspond to say numbers 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. You've been doing questions like this all your life on standardized tests. The other type of quantitative question is called data sufficiency and it's unique to the GMAT. It doesn't exist on any other standardized test and what it requires that you do is determine not the answer to a given quant question but to figure out whether you can answer that question given a couple of clues and if so do you need just one clue by itself or do you need them both this sort of thing so it's kind of a logic puzzle wrapped around a math question so it's one of the areas to really focus on and to learn the logistics of when you're first starting to prepare for the GMAT. I, I, I actually put the quant in the same category as sentence correction, where it's very rule driven, right? Where it, it's impossible to get a good sentence correction score unless you know the grammar. It's impossible to get a good math score unless you know the rules. You have to know, right, the formula for a right triangle. You have to know what a prime number is. You have to know how to solve an inequality, just things like that. You could be the smartest person in the world, the best test taker. If you don't know the content, you're going nowhere on it. And that's what I say, it's very, it's very teachable, it's very doable. You can move your score up very much if you invest that time to learn the content. So I tell people, first thing you can do right now is dust off an old book or go buy a GMAT book and start learning the content. For me, coming from an engineering background, I've always learned and applied math throughout my life. I love numbers and I enjoy manipulating equations. That said, the data sufficiency portion on the GMAT can be tricky. We'll go through some tips on how to tackle that portion, but first, let's hear from an applicant I spoke to at an MBA event. I asked him how he planned to study for the GMAT. Definitely Manhattan GMAT. Uh, I know this is uh, might be a plug for them, but <laughs> I've heard a lot of positive things about them. It's going to be a, a lot of studying on my own also, but certainly going to be registering with Manhattan GMAT to help me in that process as far as studying for it. So do you think you actually have the time to prepare for, for, for the GMAT? You know, um, the, the, thing about, uh, the good thing about trying to be or becoming an entrepreneur or being an entrepreneur is actually having to juggle a lot of different, uh, wear different hats and having to basically maximize your time. I'm actually a pretty good test taker, so I think that's going to help. But uh, finding the time is all about prioritization, figuring out exactly what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. So I'll definitely be able to find the time somehow. There's two data sufficiency types. There's yes, no questions. So I say, is x divisible by 10? Would you answer that with a number? Would you say 27, 28? No. You would say, yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, no questions. The other types are where you actually give a numerical answer. So, so what is the square root of x? Right? There you give a numerical answer. So you've got two types of data sufficiency questions. That's the first thing we always ask. It's very important to differentiate that. Most people don't do that. The second step is also probably the most important part of data sufficiency. We call that rephrasing. So, so I tell students, get really good at rephrasing. And what that means is, I can give you something very complicated. Can you take that complicated mess and simplify it down into what's the key thing that you need to know to answer it? So if I say, what is x squared to the 1 half power divided by 17? 
In order to answer that question, the minimum you need to know is x. So you can take that mess and you can simplify it down and say, what is x? Because if I know x, I can get x squared to the, whatever I said, one third power divided by 17, if I know x. So again, stripping, stripping away all the unnecessary stuff and getting to the key thing you need in order to be able to answer the question. Now when I was studying for the GMAT, I knew timing was critical. With only two minutes per question, you can't get stuck on any one question. Now it's pretty common for people not to finish, but here's what you need to know to finish on time. Because it's an adaptive exam, you have to learn to give up some battles, to lose some battles in order to win the war. And that's very hard for people. I think especially on the quantitative side, you get sucked into a problem and you don't know how to give up on it and go to plan B. So in addition to all the math content, you also have to learn how to take this very unique kind of adaptive test, which is different from a paper-based test, it requires that you lose some battles to win the war, that you fold some cards and you hold others. So force yourself during practice sessions, not even just practice exams, but while you're just running a few problems, to give up earlier on problems. Then go back and master it. Then go back and figure out what you should have done right. But you've got to optimize not just whether or not you get a question right. You've also got to optimize your speed and the ease factor, how easily you can do a problem. and. Don't forget about those. Those, are, those two factors of speed and ease are things that, that GMAT test takers often overlook. So don't just say, yeah, 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 this problem's super easy, I'm past it. Make sure that you're also figuring out how you could have done it quickly and how you could have done it as easily as possible because that's the way you solidify the floor of your performance so you don't get the easy questions wrong. That's where you really mess up on the math, is getting easier questions than you should wrong. And hitting a difficult question, letting it take you out of your game. You should be able to take a decent shot at it, moving into guess mode right away, and then move on. There has to be a balance between the verbal and the quant side. So we do, we do take a look at that. Uh, even if you take it several times, we want to see that balance between those, those two parts of the test. So that's really important. What I should warn you or maybe do not recommend you to take the test like I take it to the, today and then I'll take it like two weeks from now or, or a month from now depending on, on the GMAC policies. Um, just change your strategy. See what went wrong, what went right, where you need to kind of do something about your skills with the verbal or the quant side, and really have a strategy for that. Because if you take it again, we really want to see an increase in that score. So make sure that you have a strategy. Because sometimes we see people that take it again and go down, and take it again and just go up like 10 points, and take it again and go down again. So obviously nothing's changing there. So don't stress yourself, just kind of rethink what you're doing well or not. So, so 750 and above, I think it's 760 now, um, is 99th percentile. So what that means is out of 100 people, only one person's gonna get a 750. So to get a 700, that's the 90th percentile, one out of 10. So I always tell people in class, look around, okay? There's 20 people in here in a class, Manhattan GMAT, 20 to 30 people a class. Only two people are gonna get 700s according to that. It's a little different for us because our average, our average student is at a little bit of a higher level than just the general population for, of GMAT test takers, but, but still, it, it, it's hard to do. So set your expectations right that it's gonna take a lot of work and it's hard to do. To go, and the way it works too, is to go from a 600 to a 650 is much easier than a 700 to a 750. So it's not like a linear, just progressing up, right? It gets harder, it's exponential, it gets harder as you get into the 700s to move up. So if you wanna move from a 700 to a 750, there's a lot of really um, advanced strategies that you can use for problems. So the content, the content is the same throughout the test. So people say, okay, well, if I'm gonna get a 750, do I need to know calculus now, or do I need to know, you know some other esoteric math? No, it's the same content, but it just gets applied differently in a problem where you have multiple content types wrapped into one problem. So 600 level question is just gonna be right triangles. 750 level question is gonna be right triangle that deals with inequalities, that deals with prime numbers, all wrapped into one. So really being able to kind of 
have your foundation tight, know some advanced strategies for how to dissect those things, those parts, and, um, and that'll help get you there. It's tough, it's doable with a lot of work. Well, that's it for this edition of MBA Pod TV. I'm your host, Mia Saini. Visit us at mbapodcaster.com to download the latest audio and video shows. And of course, join us on Facebook and Twitter to get the latest news and insight into your MBA application process. Oh.